the main interest of this one is that it's one of those examples of how Henry James uses the art world again to create this feeling of time just stopping like it does in a painting while in the fluid movement of words across time. Okay, so on to my favorite one, um, The Portrait of a Lady, which is one of my favorite novels of all time, so I'm gonna have to keep this short. But in this work, Isabel Archer is an intelligent but quite pretentious girl who goes to Europe and basically her quest is to be the strong and independent woman. First of all, let's state the obvious, it's titled The Portrait of a Lady. So it's almost as if this entire... How many pages is this? Roughly 500 page book was written just to give you this instantaneous impression, just like a painting would. And then another motif, which also happened in Daisy Miller, is the art gallery. When Isabel meets another admirer, who she usually rejects, they typically have a conversation in an art gallery. And it typically also has a very shiny polished floor, which Henry James loves pointing out every time the motif happens, which also ties into the idea of the effect of light that is so prominent in the Impressionist visual arts movement. But again, it shows that she's almost studying her admirers as if they're just shallow paintings. And she's having to put her intelligence and her taste into interpreting them instead of seeing them as human beings with beating hearts. So this eventually, spoiler alert, will cause her to marry somebody who is very much a painting. It's like all he has is good taste, but there's nothing beyond that. It's just a shallow flat canvas. And all these other guys who had great hearts, she ended up rejecting because she was trying to analyze them like a painting. But she figures out later on that maybe a painting is not exactly what you want in someone you're going to spend the rest of your life with. The blurry edges that you find in this particular work are her theories about life and everyone else's theories. So Isabel was talking with her cousin Ralph and they are talking about the meaning of life. Ralph says that the meaning of life is to be as happy as possible. And then Isabel says that's what she came to Europe to do. So there's theory one. Theory two, Isabel Archer wants to be a strong independent woman and she wants to travel Europe and see how far she can go. And then Ralph, theory three, says that he wants to give her a large sum of money so that she will be able to chase her dreams and not be tied down because of economic reasons. So she has this money, she's independent, she's going around Europe and traveling, and eventually she comes back and she's like, okay, this is kind of lonely. Again, her, her theories about life are this very shallow surface level painting and she's realizing there's not much substance to that. So she comes back and she meets, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong, Madame Merle, who introduces her to Mr. Osmond. Now why does she do so? I think this is theory number four, that she has this theory, Madame Merle does, that she wants to have her part to play in life. She never settled down and got married herself, so she wants to she wants to influence Isabel's life in that area. And also she knows that Mr. Osmond, whom we find out she had a child with, wants some money because he is like a very expensive painting and has very expensive taste and he needs more money. And she knows that Isabel has the money and she basically thinks this is a perfect theory. This is gonna work out perfectly. What ends up happening is Isabel figures out that Mr. Osmond married her for money because of Madame Merle's theory that this was a good idea, partly because of Ralph's theory that he wanted to see Isabel travel the world, and so he gave her the money that caused all of that to happen. And then all of this goes back 
to Isabel's theory that she wants to be a strong independent woman and travel Europe and if she had not had that theory she probably would have married Mr. Goodwood who while he was not necessarily the most intricate and well put together of paintings he did have a very good heart as an element of kind of a tree in his name that represents life and comfort and shade. All that to say the debate about which theory of life Isabel should have followed is very prominent throughout the entire work. And now we're going to end where we began and that is the Coxong Fund, the one at the beginning that Henry James said he wanted to make an impression. In this one, Mr. Saltram is an intelligent man who, as his friends say, has so much potential but <laughs> literally nothing to show for it as he almost entirely neglects any responsibility besides entertaining guests with intelligent conversation and draining people's bank accounts because he stays at their house for free. And so again, Mr. Saltram is a literal painting. The narrator says, How the art of portraiture would rejoice in this figure if the art of portraiture had only the canvas. So again, Mr. Saltram is our painting and he is going to be debated very heavily without, throughout this work, just like all of our other lovely paintings were. The debate, the edges are very, very, very blurry in this one, which I think is very fitting because this is the one that is explicitly called an impressionist work. The entire question that we're debating in this entire work is basically put into the mouth of Ruth Anvoy, who says, do you call him a real gentleman? And then the narrator answers in the negative and she says, but isn't that positively fatal? And he says, fatal to what? Not to his magnificent vitality. You have this idea of, okay, so he's probably not the most moral of creatures, but he makes people's lives happy. Even if he drains their bank accounts, he makes people happy and he brings so much life and joy to their dinner parties and you get this idea that people almost would have rather had their money taken from them by this not necessarily gentlemanly character who they're trying to get published but won't sit down and write a book than to be without him and not have anything entertaining to do. The question is, is he a real gentleman? Like does he actually add anything to society? Is there something about him that gives to society while simultaneously being a parasite to society. The edges are very blurry on this one and it makes it a very interesting read. So as much as I would love to go into the use of color and lighting in Henry James works, which is just absolutely brilliant and one of the reasons he is one of my favorite authors, I don't have time. So we're going to move on to a little bit of a contrast with a, I think they would have lived around the same time, Tolstoy and Henry James. But we're going to be looking at Leo Tolstoy for a little bit and how his very strictly realist writing style compares with Henry James because I think having the contrast helps. One of the works we're going to be looking at is this thing that is known unfortunately mainly for its length which is so sad because it's such a good book, but War and Peace. So if, let's just have a little scenario where Leo Tolstoy were writing The Coxon Fund. You would not have all these characters having all these different debates about the character and then not hearing a single word out of Mr. Saltram, like literally not a single word the entire time. So instead you would have somebody probably sitting at a soiree and they're having a nice, dinner party and you were noticing what whoever your main character is uh, let's say it's Prince Andre right now because he's awesome so if it's Prince Andre and he's at a little dinner you're gonna be seeing every movement of his facial expressions you're gonna be seeing the inner thoughts that he is having now just like Henry James uses the main character's effect on other people to kind of characterize them. Tolstoy does this as well, and this is something he does quite a bit, but not to the extent that Henry James does. He doesn't just use the effect on other people. So you're not just getting this painting of a character. 
in this case, you could say the artist is there to speak for the painting. And so you see the inner thoughts of the main character and you see all their feelings and all their emotions, not just everybody else having an impression of them and talking about that. Whatever effect they have on others, for instance, when it says that Prince Andre made Pierre feel super happy, and then, but then other people were afraid of him, that's just to color what the centerpiece is. And the centerpiece, instead of it being other people's interpretations of him, was actually Prince Andre. Another thing to look at is the narrator. So if you look at the Coxon Fund, the narrator is the central figure of the story, just as much as Winterburn is really the main character of Daisy Miller. Because while they are sitting here interpreting their paintings, whether that be Daisy Miller or Mr. Saltram, it's their interpretation that really matters. It's their journey and the different impressions that their little paintings make on them. That's what matters. Here with Tolstoy, the narrator just gets out of the way. Like you're not supposed to see the narrator at all. It's just a perfectly clear window to see into the souls of the characters. So for instance, this is what allows him to get into the mind of Prince Andre and say, in that in Prince Andre's gaze there was yet a consciousness of his own superiority. So you're seeing inside his mind rather than just staring at the painting. So Henry James is like a Monet trying to make the super artistic, vivid, bright sort of prose. And it's very colorful and very beautiful. Tolstoy's works are also beautiful in their own way because his prose is just clear and powerful and to the point and they both have this level of beauty about them because they're like two of my favorite authors of all time um so i love both styles but it's just good to see the difference between the two and again going back to an analogy before if you were to give tolstoy the choice between a polaroid and an iphone camera chances are he would choose the iPhone camera because he's more concerned about the accurate depiction of the character. I just thought that that would be an interesting contrast and anytime that I can throw Tolstoy into anything that I am doing, I am more than happy to do so. Now I want to go into why I think Henry James himself was an impressionist painting. I'm going to, again, butcher this pronunciation, but Theodora Bozanquit or Bozanke was Henry James' secretary near the end of his life because he was having trouble writing by hand. So he got the secretary so that he could basically pace the floor and get them and dictate to them. So throughout her writing, she talks about not only how Henry James had the eye of an impressionist painter, how he was able to capture the emotion of a situation so well. Like for instance, in The Portrait of a Lady, when he talks about how Isabel's summer days at her grandmother's house had the flavor of peaches. Like he's just able to capture the emotions of something so well. So she goes into that, but she also goes into how his personality, it doesn't fit into a single box. For instance, she said, would it have been possible to fit him confidently into any single category? He had reacted with so much success against both the American accent and the English manner that he seemed only doubtfully Anglo-Saxon. He might perhaps have been some species of disguised cardinal or even a Roman nobleman amusing himself by playing the part of a Sussex squire. The observer could at least have guessed that any part he chose to assume would be finely conceived and generously played, for his features were all cast in the classical mold of greatness. He might very well have been a merciful Caesar or a benevolent Napoleon, and a painter who worked at his portrait a year or two later was excusably reminded of so many illustrious makers of history that he declared it to be a hard task to isolate the individual character of the model. 
and this is very much what you see in, for instance, this picture by Monet. Where does the bush or the tree end and the sky begin? Well, it's not necessarily at these boundaries because you have moments of the sky reflecting off of the leaves within the tree. And in here, just like with Daisy Miller, how can you tell whether she's truly innocent or not? It's this blurry line. How can you tell where Isabel Archer was to blame for her own fate or where things just simply happened to her that were mere coincidence? How can you tell whether Mr. Saltram and the Coxon Fund is genuinely good-hearted and naive or if he really needs to get his act together? How can you tell in the real thing whether Major and Mrs. Monarch were just good people in hard times or were genuinely snobbish? You can't tell. Just like you can't tell whether Henry James was from this continent or that continent. It all flows together so smoothly and in a blurry line. And I think the reason why the Impressionist paintings and the Impressionist literature of Henry James were so impactful was because they captured the essence of life. They didn't want to tell you about the time when someone jumped out and scared them. They wanted you to feel that moment for yourself. They didn't want to just paint some blue in a lake for water. They wanted to capture the movement and the hypnotic quality of being there and watching the water move or of watching the sunset go over the horizon and reflect on the waves. They wanted you to be there in that moment. That also means that characters in literature when written in this way are going to be blurry because it's when you're in the moment and you're trying to figure out what you think of somebody that you've never met or even known for a long time and still don't understand you're not going to be able to use the categories that you learned in kindergarten about this is a good character and this is a bad character because people don't work that way they're so infinitely complex and henry james captures that in such a beautiful way it's like you don't know what to make of his characters and you don't even want to because if you were to start to put them in a category of good or bad you would lose the beauty of it and you would lose the special touch that he has just like you wouldn't want to go to an impressionist painting and sharpen the edges around the bush or make the face a more distinct feature because that's not the point of it the point is not to have the sharp edges the point is the blurriness and the movement just as much as you wouldn't want water to turn into land to where everything is still and then when you go on the sidewalk and you go past the creek it's all frozen because you wouldn't get that moment of exhale when you hear the water or you see the ocean go for miles on the horizon constantly moving there's an element of movement in water and in soul that is complex and is constantly moving and is full of chaos. And artists for thousands of years have been wanting to capture that. Capture the eternal essence, not only of water and of an infinite horizon, but also of human beings in their art. To capture the divine, eternal aspect that comes with being a human. That's something the Impressionist movement does so perfectly. And it's, very proper to call it a movement because it is about the essence of movement. It's about the essence of making dynamic characters and dynamic scenes that you can live in and feel like it's real. While this is something that is not unique to the Impressionist movement, there are many other eras and movements of art that have done the same thing, that have captured what it means to be a human, not only in the literary but the artistic world. But there's something unique about the way the Impressionists do it. And it's the focus on water and it's the focus on light and color and letting color and individual quick brushstrokes define reality instead of perfect boundaries that are drawn beforehand. If we want to get extremely poetic, we can say that we all are Impressionist paintings. And so I hope that next time when you read a work from Henry James, 
or you look at an impressionist painting that you find yourself in it because the movement of the soul very much is captured in what these artists were doing. So hope you enjoy this walkthrough through Henry James and the impressionist movement as much as I did and yeah I think it is perfect time to get some afternoon tea. Go read a book.